Hey there, geographers, and welcome back to the Mr. Sin channel. Today, we're at the halfway point of Unit 4. In this video, we're going to be looking at Unit 4, Topic 5, the function of political boundaries. Boundaries are used in a variety of ways. They can help control the movement of people, goods and services, resources. They allow society to enforce their territoriality and help create a sense of place. But the question is, what happens when boundaries become contested and we start to see states fight? Throughout history and even in the modern day, we can see that states contest boundaries for a variety of reasons. Sometimes the dispute comes from just the definition of the boundary itself. This is known as a definitional boundary dispute. Here, countries will sue another country in the International Court of Justice, aka the World Court. The goal here is to try and determine what the original boundary was when it was established. These disputes often happen because states have different interpretations of the original documents that define the boundary. Disputes can also happen due to a changing landscape. These disputes are often known as locational boundary disputes. Here, the dispute is where the boundary actually is located and who controls the land. These disputes are also known as territorial disputes since it's over ownership of the land and the exact location of the boundary. Our next type of dispute is an operational boundary dispute. Here the two states are not at odds over the location or the definition of the boundary, rather how it should be operated, how it should be utilized, major issues that involve the boundary itself. For example, we could look at the United States and Mexico. They both agree where the boundary is located and are fine with the definition. However, they're at odds of how best to manage the border. Should there be a wall? Should Mexico pay for it? Should the United States pay for it? Who should be guarding that wall? Who should be enforcing it? The dispute is over the operations, the day-to-day -day control and maintaining of the border. Our last boundary dispute is an allocational boundary dispute. And this one's a little bit similar to an operational one. We're not debating over the location or the definition of the boundary. Here we're debating actually over what's in the boundary or on the boundary. Most of the time it's natural resources. For example, say that we have a large oil reserve on top of the boundary between two states. Which of the two states is going to get access to the oil? If both states get access to it, how much of the oil do both of the states get? This would create an allocational boundary dispute. Here you can see that the debate isn't over the boundary itself. Rather, it's over the natural resource and who gets to use it and also how are they going to use it? These are the things that states will have to figure out. And since we're on the topic of allocational boundary disputes, let's talk about UNICLOS, which stands for the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. This happened in 1958 when the UN had this conference to help countries better understand how to deal with allocational boundary disputes in the sea. The result of this conference was that in 1983, the International Law of the Sea was adopted. The Law of the Sea is broken up into three different zones. The first zone is the territorial water zone. This zone extends 12 nautical miles from the baseline or the shoreline of a country country. In this zone, countries are allowed to pass laws that regulate the passage of ships from other states. The next zone is the contiguous zone. This is between 12 and 24 nautical miles from the shore. Here a state may enforce laws concerning pollution, taxation, customs, and immigration. The last zone is the exclusive economic zone, or EEZ. This is between 24 and 200 nautical miles. States here have the sole right to the natural resources in this area, such as oil, fish, and other natural resources that may be located there. After that, you're in international waters, and states no longer have control. If there are disputes over the law of the sea, states can bring those disputes to the International Court of Justice to have their claims heard. Today, one of the biggest disputes over the law of the sea is happening in the South China Sea. The South China Sea is a sea that's extremely rich in natural resources. It's estimated that there's 11 billion barrels of oil, possibly up to 109 trillion feet of natural gas, and around 10% of the world's fisheries all located inside the South China Sea. So you can see there's a lot of economic potential located within the South China Sea. Plus, on top of all those natural resources, the South China Sea is connected to a choke point, the Strait of Malacca, which is used as a major trade route for different goods that are transported around the world. Currently, there's five different countries that claim part of the South China Sea as their own, and the majority majority of them use the law of the sea to justify their claim. Everyone, well, except China. China's claim to the South China Sea is based off the Nine Dash Line. This line is confusing. It originates back to an old map that was used for naval expeditions in the 15th century. And over the last 10 years, China's kind of taken things up a notch. They've started to build islands on top of reefs located in the South China Sea. Once these islands are completed, they are putting military bases on there to strengthen their hold over the South China Sea and to further justify their claim to the sea. Now, recently, the disputes in the South China Sea have centered around the Spratly Islands. This is a cluster of islands located around the middle of the South China Sea. 
Today, the Philippines, Malaysia, Vietnam, and China all claim islands within the Spratlys. And the reason why these islands are so important is because whatever country claims them can extend their EEZ according to the law of the sea. And tensions have continued to rise to the point of where the United States has started to get involved. Now, the United States does not have a claim to the Spratly Islands or the South China Sea, but the United States uses their navy to help enforce the international law of the sea. Only time will tell what will happen with the South China Sea and the dispute over the area. One thing's for sure though, China is definitely not happy with the US Navy being so close to their country or that the United States is interfering to what China says is their claim to the South China Sea. But we'll have to play the waiting game just like the rest of the world. One thing's for sure though, this region is going to remain a political hotspot. And just like that geographers, we are halfway done with unit four. Now you know the drill, the time's come to practice what we've learned. Answer the review questions on the screen right now and when you're done, check your answers in the comments below. This will make sure you're getting all the important concepts from the video. Also, if you found value in this video, consider subscribing. It's free and you can always change your mind later. Plus, if you need a little bit more help in your AP Human Geography class, don't forget to check out my ultimate review packet. You can find a link to it in the description below. It's a great resource that'll help you get an A in your class and a five on that national exam. All right, thank you so much geographers for watching the video and considering subscribing. I'm Mr. Sin and until next time, I'll see you online.